Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon to a very special occasion. This is the first the inaugural, the Linhard Award Lecture, and honoring a very special individual, Stu Oldman. So uh, many of you say, wow, we know the Linhard Award's been around for a while. Uh, Daryl was asking me how long, I say since 1986, right? And, but we feel that this award, which is for the National Academy of Medicine, arguably the most prestigious one, deserves its own celebration and recognition. So a little bit of background. Uh, first of all, um, Gustav Linhardt uh, was the president of Johnson Johnson and chair the RWJ Board of Trustees from the foundation, from the organization's establishment, pardon me, of 1971 to his retirement in 1986. In a period in which the foundation was found and it moved to the forefront of American philanthropy in healthcare. So the Leonhard Award was funded by an endowment from the RWJ Foundation, and of course in uh, honor of uh, Gustav Leonhard. And uh, it was established in 1986, then the Institute of Medicine, or IOM. As I said today, this award is the oldest, and arguably the most prestigious award at the uh, National Academy of Medicine. Um, so I, before I get into more discussion, I do want to recognize uh, Dwayne Proctor, who is a senior advisor to the president at RWJ, for your presence. Thank you, Dwayne. <laughs> we have, uh, I, I can say this to you, I mean it, probably the strongest relationship with any foundation as with RWJ. We do so many things together through the years and now. Many of you know many of our initiatives are supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but some of the notable studies like the future of nursing, which is actually now meeting the 10th year, and in 2020 we're going to release another report for the next 10 years. Right? That, by the way, is the most downloaded report ever at National Academies. It transformed nursing in so many ways. We also work with uh, RWJ on the culture of health. That's a five-year grant with a five-year endowment or an endowment. And now we are going to renew. At least we're going to hope we renew uh, <laughs> in the fall for another 10 years. But so much has come out from that initiative in terms of studies and convening, you name it. So our relationship with RWJ is really unique. And not to say that Risa Visa Moore is one of my students. That was good too. Um, so why do we do it this year this way? Well, you know, when we became the National Academy uh, three and a half years ago, hard to believe, it seemed to be much longer than that, we decided what we need to do is to project ourselves even further from an institute to an academy. and therefore increasing the visibility and stature of the academy. And so to highlight this award and its visibility by holding a standalone celebratory event, in addition to, of course, our annual meeting, we we'll still be conferring the award at the annual meeting, we believe is the right thing to do. And so this is the first year we're doing this and already seeing the enthusiast, robust turnout, we know that we'll be doing this for a while. So it's very, very exciting. Uh, we have a lecture, and then, of course, we're going to host a private dinner in honor of uh, Stuart Oldman, the winner. So um, if you think about what we do uh, overall in healthcare and, of course, in national academy medicine, we understand, of course, the importance of healthcare systems and the importance of innovation and the importance of uh, payment and all those things that related to healthcare. And of course, we can't think of a better individual to uh, be receiving this award this year and be the speaker. Stuart Allman is the 33rd recipient of the Leonhardt Award, and he'll speak today about systemic, systemic and health consequences of payment gap between Medicare and private insurance. 
Now, we will present the award to him at the 2018 Linhardt Award at the annual meeting. And uh, I would say that we are looking forward to next year, in which Stuart has now went from recipient to a judge. So he's now on the selection committee, chaired by Don Berwick, with John Ayanian, uh, uh, Kevin Grumbach, David Mechanic, Diane Meyer, Mark Smith. So they all volunteered to serve, and we look forward to, uh, to the nomination, which will start actually March the 1st. So if I may introduce to it, by the way, if you wonder why I asked Lord De Stefano, why do we schedule my opening remarks at uh, 4.45, I said, such a long introduction for Stuart. Stuart, you've done so much. So, he's the Saul Chaikin Professor of National, National Health Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis in Waltham, Massachusetts. Over the last 50 years, as an economist, Stuart has helped improve health insurance program in the United States and the efficiency of its delivery system. Dr. Altman has demonstrated leadership through service on several federal and state government advisory boards, beginning with his role as Deputy Secretary, Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation of Health at the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare at the Nixon administration. His work in this role helped spur the growth of comprehensive managed care plans and funded an important study measuring the impact of cost sharing on medical service use. Stuart also acted as advisor to five U.S. presidential administrations in total. During his time at Brandeis, he founded the Schneider Institute for Health Policy, a research center best known for developing social HMO, which integrated financing for acute services, long-term care, and social support to provide more effective coordinated care for elderly uh, uh, patients. To facilitate better research to support health policy decision making, Dr. Altman and colleagues formed the Association for Health Services Research in 1981, which is now known as Academy Health. Uh, the organization has more than 4,000 members, hosts a prominent U.S. health service research conference each year. Stewart served as chairman of PROPAC, Independent Commission to Advise Congress on Medicare Payment Policy, and under his leadership, PROPAC became a widely respected source for unbiased, impactful analysis. Its recommendation frequently led to important policy changes. In addition to his leadership in national health policy, his work as chairman of the Health Policy Commission of Massachusetts led to reports and recommendations that considered a modeled approach for states trying to control health spending but adverse to regulating it directly. So you can imagine, I've only read a small part of what you've done, Stuart, but thank you really so much for all the things you've done for the health of the nation. We're so honored that you are the Linhard Award recipient and you give this lecture. So please help me welcome Stuart Alman. Thank you. Did I read it well? Yeah, you did good. <laughs> You read almost everything I wrote. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, what a pleasure. Um, you know, every time I walk into this building, I feel a little chill. I mean, it's, it was, it's hard to think back, but I think it was in the late 1960s I came here for the first time, even before the beginning, you know, as the IOM was being formed and had a lot to, in the early stages of, and I'm so proud of having received the Leanheart Award. It's, I knew Gus. Um, I, I spent more than a few times with him uh, in the beginning of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's transition. So this is really a pleasure. But that's where the pleasure ends. I'm really, I'm almost nervous about this talk. I mean, I don't get nervous very often uh, about giving talks, or I would have been dead a long time ago because I give a lot of them. But um, I said to myself now, what could I possibly tell this group that they don't already know. And I finally decided nothing. So I decided to turn the table around and to sort of bring up a topic I don't really know the answer to, but I really increasingly think it's becoming a very serious public 
problem. And as I think about, I anticipated a little bit the audience that was going to be here. I said, there's no one in this audience that what I'm going to talk about does, couldn't affect as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me proceed um, and, and just lay out the facts as I've put them together and reinterpreted them. <laughs> I don't want to get into that too much. Uh, all right, so um, let's go back. When this country passed uh, Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, and some of you know this very well, most of you, uh, the commitment that was made in the passage of the act was that both Medicare and Medicaid, by the way, would pay hospitals and doctors what they were getting in the private sector. And in fact, much of the original payment system, as you know, was really modeled after Blue Cross around the country. So um, that was the commitment um, that Medicare would pay. And as a result, Medicare beneficiaries would have access to all the medical personnel, physicians, hospitals, and so on. And that was the commitment that was made. And as all of you know, we went forward with a essentially retrospective cost-based reimbursement system. And um, some of us very early on began to say, oh my god, what are we doing? And so by the, even the late 1960s, and I came on in 1970, 71, and we were facing this very rapid growth in our spending. <clears throat> and many of us played a, during the 70s trying to figure out how we were going to change our system. And as you pointed out, Victor, in 1982, as we know, and I see Stuart Gutterman here, who was part of the group then, um, and Karen, you were there too. So, uh, we finally, this country finally decided that it would uh, re fundamentally restructure the payment system and introduce the prospective payment, the RG payment system. Uh, but, and this is an important but, in restructuring and changing how the payment system was made, the decision was further made that overall payments to the hospital industry would be similar to what had been paid before. And um, <laughs> the, we, we asked the, the, those spe special strange people called actuaries, we said, OK, we're going to totally change everything. And you have to figure out a way to pay the rates so that the amount of money is exactly the same as it would have been had we not changed the rates. Well, they missed by a couple of billion dollars for a couple of years, and as a result, Hospitals wound up with a little more money than they expected, like about $9 billion, but that's another story. We won't talk about that part. Um, anyway, um, for the most part, up until the late 1990s, if you looked at the, different, the payment expenditures from Medicare to, and private, the gap was really quite small. So if you look at that period, even as late as 1996, 1998, what the Medicare payment rates were and what private insurance were, the gap was almost infinitesimal. Well, here's the issue. And we're beginning, you're beginning to hear this. When I started looking at this a year or two ago, I felt like I was like talking to nobody. Nobody was listening to me. Now there are more articles being written. As we begin to debate Medicare for all, this is going to be a very important issue. Um, for those of you who are uh, involved in one way or other with our academic medical centers and with research, what I'm going to talk about really fundamentally gets at the heart. We have really substantially and growingly restructured how we are paying our health care system. Now, this article, this only took you to 2012, and I'll keep going. You begin to see the gap and <clears throat> the growth where the two payment structures are really on two very different paths. Medicare 
for some good and maybe some not so good reasons, but mostly for good reasons, is on its own glide path and is not related to the costs as the, as the hospitals would see it in terms of their costs. Medicare is much more in terms of its payment related to as it sees its budget implications and so on. And so this gap is getting wider and wider. Medicare, which uh, used to be, and again, I, I want to make it very clear, I'm not arguing that Medicare is underpaying, but we have to put that aside. We really need to look at the implications of what we're doing. And for a long time, we have not looked at them. So what's happened to Medicare margins, which we used to call them, which were quite substantial in the 90s. As a matter of fact, it was one of the key reasons why we had debate over the Balanced Budget Act and the closing of the government, and many of you remember that, was the fact that hospitals were making a very substantial amount of money on a Medicare program that was on a separate glide path, and the Balanced Budget Act changed that. But look what's happened, and you know this. So as I said, I'm not telling you necessarily anything new, but the implications of this to the point where in 2017, the average margin was a negative over 11.2%. Now, <clears throat> I know many of you either work for or represent teaching hospitals in America, and I have more than a fond feeling about many of our <coughs> teaching hospitals having served on several of their boards. Now, some of them don't like me as much as they used to like me, but it's my job, non-paid, that is. Anyway, teaching hospitals did quite well under the new DRG payment system uh, and were one of the most successful hospitals. So if you look back even to 2002, that checkered big uh, tower there uh, was the margins of teaching hospitals, much higher than any other for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the very um, attractive, financially attractive extra payment for teaching. Uh, that was built into the DRG payment system. But as we move into the 2000 period, even our big high um, paid teaching hospitals are now, and if you go to 2013, and I'll do it more recently, every hospital except one which are our rural uh, referral centers, are, um, uh, are every hospital type is now losing money on Medicare. Now, I want to make it very clear, we're talking about averages here. So, everybody knows this, and if you don't, um, I've explained it to you. So the question is, sh so what? Should we be concerned? So let's play this one out for a little while. Are hospitals in serious financial trouble? Are there winners and losers with the current hospital payment system? And perhaps most importantly, are Medicare beneficiaries being denied services in some hospitals as a result of this? So let's look at the information. So let's look at um, that gap between what hospitals pay, uh, receive from private insurance, and what they pay, receive from government. Now, for many years, the term cost shifting was bantied around, that hospitals actually had a budget which was made independently based on the cost that they were facing, and then they went around and they tried to find the revenue to meet that budget. And if one sector of the system went low, they would go to another sector to get more. People said, oh, no, that's not. First, it was The Economist who were trained in their good classical economic theory, they go, oh, you can't have that. Every, every organization maximizes profits, and hospitals really are profit maximizers. They can't do cost shifting. And then we had government apologists saying, hey, what we pay has nothing to do with what private pay. You can't blame us for high private rates because the costs uh, that we're paying, which is fine. And I get it. I, I get it, I get it. There is technically no technical cost shifting going on. Well, maybe some. And probably the best article that I've ever read is Jamie Robinson's piece back almost 10 years ago. 
And it says it depends. It depends how powerful the hospital is relative to the insurance industry in the area. Some hospitals do have the capacity to pretty much dictate. Some hospitals have no capacity to dictate. They take the prices. So is there cost shifting? OK, there's not cost shifting. But that does not mean that we have not seen this gap get wider and wider. In 2016, the average, on average, that uh, private payers were paying 50 plus percent more than the costs, and probably 70 percent or 80 percent more than what Medicare pays. But that's the average. If you go around this country, you'll find some areas, like my good place in Northern California, where some hospitals are getting 150 to 200 percent of Medicare. As a matter of fact, when you, but no tears for the hospital industry, on average. Margins are as strong for the hospitals. And I just read yesterday, I didn't have time to change the slide, in 2017, the margin actually went back up to over 7%. So no tears for the hospitals yet. So I'm not here to either blame or think, let's just look at this. And we just recently saw, you know, we've, the second fight we've been, so cost shifting is modified. It exists, but doesn't exist. The second argument is we've been having as a research community is what's driving healthcare costs. And we've heard all this stuff about all the waste and we're gonna get rid of, you know, Bob Brook told me in 1971 we waste 40%. Now we're hearing we waste 40%. The only difference is the number of zeros in the 40%. Well, I must admit I've, I've never been part of the waste police. If you compare us to Europe, where they're spending so much less than we are, they use more hospital days, they go to the doctor more often, yeah, they get somewhat less MRIs, and the truth of the matter is, as my good friend Uwe Reinhardt and others said, it's the prices, stupid. What's happening is that this industry is jacking up. And this latest article showed that the growth in private insurance spending is dominated by hospital price growth. So what we're seeing, and I've said this to the insurance industry, I've said this to employers, you have become the great ATM machine in the, in the sky for the American healthcare system. The gap that you are now supporting is huge and it is continuing to grow. So the question is, so what? Well, there, I do believe there is a so what here. And it is something that you, we, really need to take seriously. What we do about it is what I really want to talk to you about. Because doing something is going to be not so easy. Uh, first of all, as I said, it varies all over the country. And it varies by the kind of hospital, how well they're doing. So this is a chart that was recently put together. And it shows margins by type rural in blue, urban are in the, uh, and critical access hospitals. And of course, you know, it depends critically on, you know, w how well you're doing, uh, where the, the rural is sort of in the middle, um, our uh, urban hospitals are doing well, and our critical access hospitals do very well on Medicare and very poor on private insurance. If you look by teaching, our teaching hospitals, as I said, we're doing fine under Medicare. Well, they're not doing so fine when you look at total margins uh, compared to other teaching or non-teaching hospitals. CBO recently, in, well, not recently, in 2013, showed that the gap varies. In some regions, the gap is small, 44%. In other regions, it's 148%. And I said, that's an average. There are... There are more and more examples of two to three hundred percent difference between private insurance and Medicare. So, the MedPAC report. Now, I don't know. We must have somebody here from MedPAC. I mean, you know, I was an old ProPAC guy. You know, we've elevated MedPAC. I love MedPAC, and I read it thoroughly. But I, I think MedPAC's been a little slow at the switch on this issue. I can understand why. But now they're beginning to. You know, when they looked at. You know, if you look at 
at, at some of these studies, 55% of the highly profitable hospitals were for profit. Underneath that surface of what's going on is some very substantial differences. But many also are not for profit, seven of, seven of the 10 most profitable. Now, also teaching hospitals. While some teaching hospitals are really getting beat up, there are some teaching hospitals, thank you, that are doing very well. And two of the 10 most profitable hospitals were big teaching hospitals. Hospitals and systems do much better than independent institutions, and public and rural hospitals have the highest losses. So we're beginning to see an increase, well, it's been going on for a while, and it's now growing more and more. The difference between the have and the have not hospitals. So let me switch gears a minute and um, talk a little about what we're looking at in Massachusetts, because we've learned a few things. Now, for those of you who have not followed, Massachusetts in 2012, uh, well, in 2006, Massachusetts, as you know, passed uh, its uh, comprehensive universal health care bill. Has a little to do with what the Affordable Care Act looked like. And, um, and it did what I consider to be the right thing. Some people criticized people in Massachusetts for doing this. It said, yeah, I know we got two problems, if not three. We have a, an access problem, and we have a cost problem. But we're not going to try to solve them both at the same time. And you know, the wise people, not necessarily in this room, said, oh, these are two problems. You have to solve them together. Well, I learned a long time ago, and I now call it Altman's rule. You try to solve both those problems at the same time, and you will solve neither of them. And so Massachusetts, not and the Affordable Care Act said, we're going to deal with access first, and then we're going to deal with costs. And lo and behold, surprise of surprises, passed the Affordable passed the, the Access in 2006. And in 2012, they passed a, a pretty serious cost containment law. And the key to the cost containment law was a commitment on the part of the state to be concerned most importantly, about total spending in the state, not just its Medicaid budget. And second, that the total spending in the state should not grow by more than the state's growth in its state income. And at that point, it was pegged at 3.6%. Now it's pegged at 3.1%. And to make sure that we knew what was going on, it established two outside, well, semi-outside commissions. One, CHIA, the Center for Health Information Analysis, which is by most counts probably the best. Massachusetts probably knows more about the, how, what its structure of its system looks like and how it's functioning than any other parts of the country. And they collect the data. And the second group, the Health Policy Commission, which is responsible for monitoring these costs, finding out why they're going up, finding out how to do something about them when they can. And, it, and it's made up of 11 commissioners and a staff. And it's modeled, I would say, with some pride, a lot after the, the ProPAC, MedPAC model that was established here. And, and they asked me what I thought would work. And I said, I, I'm a big believer in the way ProPAC and MedPAC was set up. So they said, OK, we're going to set it up, and you chair it if you will. I think they asked please, but I said, of course, I would do it. But, and I've been doing it now since 2012. But what's important is the information and how it can play out to what we're talking about here. First of all, we, in, uh, two weeks ago, we issued a cost report, which we're required to each year. So first of all, if you look at, at a Massachusetts, which is in orange, this is the rates of growth in commercial spending per enrollee. Remember that ATM machine. And as you'll notice from 2000, if you go back, the orange growth rate was substantially higher than the blue one, which was the, uh, the federal, the overall at US. And here's Massachusetts. But beginning in around 2012, how ironic, 2012, since that time, Massachusetts growth rate has been substantially under the U.S. average. And if you estimate it, it comes out to about five, I'm sorry, 
it comes out to about um, five and a half billion dollars less spending on the commercial side. But let's look below the surface. First of all, we looked, whoops, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can ever get it back. Yeah. If you look at the difference in average hospital payments per discharge, commercial and Medicare, you'll notice the average gap in Massachusetts is 57%. But sitting there on top of the commercial is, and, and going to the bottom here, Medicare, of course, doesn't have much of a gap, is like 80%. But what we also looked at was it varies by procedure. So if you go to like, this is hips and joints, the gap is about 50%. If you go, to, and don't ask me why, I, I don't know. Cellulitis, very little gap. OR procedures for obesity, fairly small gap, a very large gap in sepsisemia. So, and we have it by every classification. So we now know that the pricing, not only there's an average, but there are all differences that are jumping around. If you look at average payment per hospital outpatient department, and say you take colonoscopy. So first of all, the, um, the professional is in orange and the, how much the facility gets. And here's commercial and here's Medicare. And here's brain MRIs. Uh, again, you'll notice that the facility is much higher than, the, than, than even here relative to the professional. And again, here's Medicare. And here the gap is 129% where this one, the gap is 60%. <clears throat> Another one, average payment for hospital emergency department, again, commercial in, uh, in orange, and Medicare. So there's a gap on the professional side of over 113% between Medicare and, and, and uh, commercial. On the facility side, the gap is much smaller. Now, we bring up all this thing, because if we start dealing with it, we've got to recognize that we're dealing with a complicated delivery system. Again, this shows the gap between new patients and established person, patients and so on. So, so what? So as MedPAC has said several times, you know, well, you know, we're really not so worried about this. Um, no one's n being denied access to care on the Medicare program. Hospitals are doing all right. Um, we have a certain number of hospitals which we call uh, efficient hospitals. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so no big deal. Okay, right now that's true. I don't think there is, there may be one person in America that's been denied hospital care, but it's not a serious problem. Play this one out for five to 10 years. Can you tell me in, in complete sure that if this gap keeps getting wider and wider, we will not see hospitals begin to cater to non-Medicare patients? And you say, well, that had never happened. Well, let's look at the physician side. So, well, first of all, let me, okay, let me continue the thought. I'll get to it later. If we look at the hospitals, uh, the physician side, it depends on where you live. If you live in my part of the world and in DC and in Los Angeles and San Francisco, the concept of concierge medicine is really beginning to grow. Sure, you come to other parts of the country, you say concierge medicine, they have no idea what it is. Now, I will say, among friends here, I think concierge medicine is illegal, it's fattening, and I must admit, I joined it. <laughs> so why is it illegal, I thought. Well, as far as I know, there's a law somewhere in the books of the federal government that says that it's against the law for a doctor to charge more for a Medicare procedure than what Medicare pays. Maybe just a little bit different so you can get a little extra. Well, the concierge doctors charge you an upfront amount of money, depending on where you live, from 
I don't know, 1,000 to 5,000, whatever. And I said, well, what do they do that's really different than a non-concierge doctor when it comes? I mean, so I, so for many years I just said, this is craziness, this is illegal. But it kept growing. And after losing three primary care physicians in four years, and the final one, nice guy, a good doctor, he said, I've had it, I'm going concierge. So I thought about this for a while and I said, what do you do that allows you to charge this extra rate? And I finally figured it out. A concierge doctor promises to love their patients. <laughs> so I went to this guy, uh, honest, among friends here, I said to them, I will join you under one condition. I do not want to be illegal, and I don't want you to be illegal. So every time I come to see you, you have to hug me. <laughs> and he does. He's not, he's not the warmest guy. It's not the best hug I ever got. But the reality is that the reason why concierge medicine is considered legal is concierge doctors, and there's no code in the Medicare dictionary for love. <laughs> One of these days, you're going to see hospitals with a big sign with a heart on it. I love you. Pay $5,000, and then in addition to that, Medicare will pay the difference. I don't know when that will come. I don't know if it will come. But I do know this. Those numbers that I've shown you up to now, hospitals are doing all right. And the truth is, and MedPAC has indicated, on the margin, Medicare is still, um, Medicare patients are still profitable for most hospitals. We're talking about averages. So the, the next Medicare patient that walks in the door, even though the hospital claims they've lost 11, 12 percent, they're probably they're getting more in, in revenue than it's costing them for that margin. That is true. But let's look at other trends that are going on. If you project out into the future, there's going to be almost no growth in private insurance. All of the growth that's going to occur, is, and this is done independent of the Affordable Care Act, is really in Medicare and Medicaid. Now, if Medicare continues to be constrained and private payments grows, could there be access limits for Medicare? And as I said about concierge medicine. Now, let me be very clear. My own personal views. I am not advocating more money to be spent to hospitals. I do believe this country is spending too much money on health care. And I also believe that the only way to constrain spending is to constrain spending. You're never going to save enough money by, by don't doing this rather than this. A couple of years ago, I got a call from a, sounded like a, I don't want to be disrespectful, a young analyst for a, a, a newspaper out of New York. And uh, she said, explain to me why costs go. I said, how much time do you have? She said, any time. Anyway, I went on for about 45 minutes. I gave one of the best lectures I've ever given in my life <laughs> about cost. I talked about all the different forces and stuff like that. And of course, the next day, I immediately ran to the newspaper to see what she quoted, you know, like most of us. So I looked at the newspaper, and she wrote this long article, and there was this one half a sentence. Professor Altman says, if you want to spend less money, spend less money. <laughs> at that point, I used to Google my name. And the next day, I got a Google, and somebody said that was the stupidest quote they had ever read. <laughs> Well, I believe it's not stupid. I believe the reality is that if you want to slow the growth in spending, you have to slow the growth in spending. And have the industry deal with less revenue. Because like any industry, if you keep giving it more money, it will figure out a way to spend it. As a former president of a university, I can guarantee you that if, that if we get a double amount of, of philanthropy, we're going to figure out very good reasons to spend that money. So I'm not blaming the health industry. Every industry is the same. So I'm not here advocating that we necessarily should be cutting back spending. 
But here's the should the constraints only come from the government side? I think that is increasingly dangerous in many different ways. As I said, it's going to affect access on the part of government insured. It's going to affect winners and losers, depending upon the patient mix. I'm sorry for those of you who are strong advocate MedPAC. I do not believe that those hospitals are necessarily more efficient. It has a lot to do with the mix of their patients. Yeah, they show other areas, and I know they're sophisticated. But the mix of your patients makes a tremendous difference in whether you're a winner and losers. And some of the losers are our most important safety net hospitals. And the third thing is, as I pointed out, uh, I don't think this is going to continue. I'm not saying 2017 is the turning point. But I've been told that you're increasingly going to see in 2018 private insurance begin to constrain what they're willing to pay hospitals. You're seeing more and more um, uh, what we call limited or tiered networks that are growing, people are complaining about them, but it's a way that the insurance industry and the employers are saying no more. So this idea that somehow the great ATM machine in the sky is just going to continue to print that money, I don't think it's going to happen. But most importantly, I don't think it's healthy for the American healthcare system to have the constraint only on one side of the equation. Whoops, I'm sorry. The last slide said, I think what Massachusetts is doing, Rhode Island is doing it, uh, Maryland is doing it, Many other states are now beginning to say we have responsibility not only for our Medicaid program, but for total spending in the state. And we are going to constrain total, which means you're going to have to constrain the private side. The question is whether the federal government needs to play in that role. So the question I leave you and would, one, would welcome a discussion is what do we do about this thing? First of all, do you think it's a problem? Second, if you do, how do we deal with it? And by the way, the discussion about Medicare for all is going to hinge very much on this thing. If all of a sudden we take the, the, the ATM machine and we close it down, what are the implications for the hospitals? Again, I'm not shedding any tears for hospitals, although I care more about them now than I used to. <laughs> Somehow the gray hair and falling apart has an impact on you. But be that as it may, the point is that um, we need to think seriously. So let me stop now, and I would welcome discussions about this. No physical violence, but if you have different opinions. But I also, most importantly, want to know if you think it's a problem, and B, how we should deal with it. So thank you very much. We have time. So I think we'll open it for Q&A now. There's a mic in the middle and a mic on the side. And if you can't get up, just give me a wave, and I'll bring you the handheld. Yeah. Oh, and if you can just say your name and your affiliation, if you have one. Errol Kirch uh, from the Stuart Altman Fan Club at the AMC. <laughs> I, I have a few. Thank you. You know, you, you really laid out so beautifully this, this issue of the gap between the commercial and the Medicare. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the same issue between Medicare and Medicaid. But um, but what about the cost shift to the patient, which is what concierge medicine is, right? Yes. In a sense. Yes, and I, I you know, we, it's harder. Thank you. You know, it's harder to see it at the hospital level um, because there's so many differences. But you're absolutely right, um, and particularly on the commercial side now, more and more of the employers and the insurance companies are saying, "We're not going to pay it. We're just going to tack it on." And I might add, I would also say the same thing, you know, for a lot of the pushback of the Affordable Care Act among small businesses and, and related people that are not at the top end of the income stream but not subsidized has to do with this. I mean, we are asking, it's not only, it, we are asking a subset of the American people to really increasingly pay for the health care system of America. I didn't even go into that. It's not being shared equally at all. 
If you're a small business, I don't care where you are, you're bearing the brunt of this thing and the people that work for you, so, and including the patients. You're absolutely right. Hi, Stuart. Hi, I'm Stu Gutterman. Um, thanks, Stuart, for a lifetime of, of work in this area. But, um, and I'm glad you mentioned Maryland. I've been doing some work with the state of Maryland on this um, stuff, and, and I'm, I'm struck by uh, the fact that um, private payers, uh, as, as opposed to, my, according to my numbers, uh, private payers pay an average of 145% of cost to America's hospitals. Um, and uh, lest that be seen as a subsidy for non-paying patients, um, the, that 145% figure actually goes to hospitals that treat predominantly privately insured patients. And so the safety net hospitals are in, end up getting stuck out in the cold. Um, uh, but um, uh, what we find in Maryland is that uh, CMS, another aspect of the discrepancy between private and public is that um, now CMS is pushing back on Maryland to lower its Medicare payments, uh, particularly because um, while overall Medicare, uh, overall healthcare spending in Maryland isn't uh, very high compared to other states, um, the figure that I heard is that Maryland um, gets $2, million, $2 billion a year more from Medicare than other states, and that helps make those rates even. Um, so. It's two um, with a B. Yeah, so it's it's, it's it's still large, but but the total spending is is lower. Of course, CMS is primarily focused on Medicare spending, so um, that's another aspect of Medi Medicare for all that might uh, get taken into account. On, on that issue, quickly, um, I, it's always um, interested me um, when people compare private payment rates and and Medicare payment rates. Um, that they uh, ignore the potential difference in the cost of treating older patients as opposed to younger patients. Um, um, somewhere I saw, I think years ago, Mike Morrissey did a study where he found that Medicare patients on average cost 29% more well, that makes the problem even than worse. younger. Well, but if, 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 um, if, Medicare, if Medicare's nominal rates were applied to younger patients, and if younger patients are 29% cheaper, than Medicare patients. That discrepancy between Medicare rates and private rates wouldn't be so great when applied to privately insured, what people who are now privately insured. And hospitals might actually, by my calculations, hospitals actually would be able to turn a profit on those rates um, because, because younger patients are cheaper. So it's, people tend to look at nominal rates and, and they look at payment rates across payers, but they don't look so much at the what the impact that payments have on costs. Um, the, fi the final thing, I know I'm taking up time, but um, well, the final thing is that um, mm. uh, I, I, I'm always struck uh, over the years that uh, my economists, and I'm an economist, my economist friends all say that cost shifting doesn't exist. Every single person I know who works in the healthcare sector in actual healthcare delivery assumes there's cost shifting. And, in, and they're the ones who would be doing the cost shifting, so they should know. So it's kind of always amused me that the economics profession never has recognized cost shifting. I think part of the reason is they don't interpret the term correctly. But So truth in information is that Stuart taught me all this stuff. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's true. And so he and I were the only ones who were saying, you've got to be kidding me. There's no cost shifting. And he said it. So you know, the one thing, though, uh, John, before I just comment, so if you, you look at, you know, I mean, the cost reports are the cost reports, and they're, whether they mean anything or not, but the margins are relative to Medicare costs, and they're still showing that 11%, and if, if you say that the gap, if, if the Medicare rates are being asked to pay for a sicker population relative to the, the gap, that part gap gets wider, but your, your comments are well taken. We need a lot more information about this. As I said, we need to understand who's paying the bill. I mean, the pushback on the Affordable Care Act, which I think is a, I'm a big Affordable Care Act guy, um, but I, I'm very sympathetic to the small businesses and the individuals who are above the cutoff point that really got right. hit hard, and this added to it. John? Right. 
Uh, Stuart, thank you. Uh, John Rother with the National Coalition on Healthcare. Uh, you asked for what to do about this, so yes. I'm going to give you three, three options. Yeah, and okay? you better send it to me because I won't remember it. <laughs> so the first one uh, Stuart already commented on, which is all payer rate setting, which uh, has the small disadvantage of raising Medicare costs and in the name of equalizing payments. So, uh, well, you, know, you could leave Medicare alone and just bring the other down. Well, okay, but uh, I think Maryland does show that it works and it can be successful. Second way to go forward is to uh, for states to limit commercial payment rates to a percent of the Medicare rate, and we're seeing uh, two or three states now uh, start to pursue this. Yeah. Uh, you know, for better or for worse, but it's a way to uh, force action. And the third way uh, is to change incentives for the hospitals so they're no longer trying to fill beds, but uh, instead trying to uh, work in the community to uh, improve health outcomes without admitting patients. That's perhaps um, a more ambitious approach, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. One more comment, if I could. Sure. Medicare for all. It's going to evolve to uh, Medicare buy-in for people 50, 55 uh, as an option. And that could change this equation very much because you're taking the most expensive people out of the commercial pool, putting them into Medicare, and uh, that could change the whole relationship. Yeah, well, you and I need to talk about how you would fund the 50, you know, people say, well, great, you have all these young people going into the Medicare, um, they're gonna really help the Medicare pool. But if they're all the sicker ones, you and I need to talk about how they're gonna fund that one, but I'm in favor of allowing down, but right. I think you, all three are ways of doing it. The, my main, what I, what I really wanna leave you with is even if we don't immediately find a solution, more and more of you in this room need to focus on this issue. So that's my main thing. But thank you, John. My name is Ruth Lubick. I was uh, the Leonhard in 2001. Yes. Because of work that I had been doing here in uh, the District of Columbia, which is uh, to serve low-income childbearing families. And I want to ask you how you would apply all these wonderful things which I have trouble processing to the fact that the maternal mortality and the infant mortality in this country are so high. And where, why has that happened? It, does that have to do with cost? Um, so please, I'm credited with having started the first freestanding birth center in the country in 1975. And now there are more than 350 operating. There has been a recent study by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which shows how much lower the, the loss is. I'm not talking about money loss, I'm talking about people loss. When you have uh, midwives involved with physicians in providing care in the community, and uh, so I would like your comments on, on well, my Well, I wish I could complaint. say something profound, but I really can't. I mean, I'm not trying to say that this gap solves all the problems in our system. And I think what you laid out is a very serious problem that you probably know more about the reason, whether it's lack of coverage to begin with, you no know, prenatal, they're not getting the right thing, whether it's our society that's driving these people, they're not. It's a terrible statistic, and, and the fact that w such a rich country like ours is letting that happen is atrocious. So I, I wish I had a, 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 a savvy answer to your but I don't. And I don't want to say that this gap in and of itself is causing it or making it worse, but why not? It's causing enough other problems, so I may be able to add it to that one, too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen I Fisher. I have to move because that light keeps getting in my eye. I can't see. Hi, Karen. Uh, hi, Karen Fisher at the WMC. It, but I'm speaking a little bit personally as someone who's also learned at the tutelage of Stuart Ohm and Ann Stuart Gutterman. Um, so you could have probably done a three-hour talk because when I think about hospitals, the involvement of hospitals 
uh, from where they were in the 80s in the DRG system and what they are today. Uh, they're not hospitals, they're systems. And I would say a little bit, uh, John, uh, the role of the outpatient and how much more is being done in outpatient settings. Certainly, Daryl and I work for teaching hospitals where occupancy rates are in the 90s percent. So they're happy to move as much as they can, and they are. There's a lot of innovation going in in what's being done in the outpatient setting than it was before. So we have to look at that globally. Um, I also would be interested in your thoughts about uh, the role in hospitals taking on more and more of the community care, some of the risk. I, I sort of think it was the uh, the ACA and the readmissions penalty, where the hospital said it's not, you know, it's not our control. What happens? How do why they come back? Well, they went out anyhow, and they started doing uh, things for patients in the communities. And it just seems where a lot of people said with ACOs, I think, well, the hospitals are the cost center. Let's not have them in charge. They're a coster. But whether that's whether you believe that or not, the fact of the matter is it seems hospitals are taking on more role in terms of taking on risk, in terms of ACOs. And I'm just curious how you see that because I think as we see it today, it's still looking at this hospital as an individual entity. And I just don't think as we move forward, as you always say, for good or bad, I'm not making a real opinion about this, but it just seems that hospitals as being systems are taking on a larger role in, in the outcome of the total spent. Not just that. I, I would just make one more point on John's point about uh, the states or the commercial. I think the one issue, though, John, is, of course, ERISA. And so the states can dictate price increases, but you're not going to affect a lot of the pricing because of the ERISA. And I think that's when you have to think about the role of the federal government. I know you know that. So thank you. I'm so there's a lot in there. First of all, uh, let me... Um my good friend and colleague Rob Mechanic is here, so I need to be careful when I talk about ACOs. Uh, but I share your comment, Karen. Um, I remember when the ACO was first introduced and there was a group of people that were very outwardly spoken that were saying that this is a way that primary care physicians and the physician community are going to rise up and take control of the health system, and they're going to make the hospitals a cost center. And I just shook my head and go, I'm not very religious, but the, the weak and the poor will inherit the earth. It's the, that's what it sounded like. The, for better or worse, the hospitals in most parts of this country are the center of the health system, if not the center of the employment system. And unless and until you get the hospitals as a key part of the, of the change, you're never going to get it. Sure, it's easy for a physician group that isn't related with a cost center to sort of show they're making money on the ACO. Until and unless you get the hospitals to, to show that they can do it, you're never going to change fundamentally the healthcare system. So you're absolutely right, it's the hospitals, stupid that need to be responsible for, when all gets said and done, community care. I'm not against physician-led groups, they're fine, but they're, you know, they're a tiny part of the total healthcare system. So we do, and I'll tell you the one thing, if you look at what we do at, at, the, at the Health Policy Commission, we're very conscious of this. We talk about systems, we talk about outpatient. Now there are some not so good things going on by some hospitals like surprise billing and adding facility fees to people who go to outpatient urgent centers. They don't know anything about it, and all of a sudden they get a bill that said, oh, by the way, there's a facility fee that you have to pay in addition to your insurance. That's wrong. But the idea that the hospital needs to be the center of community-based care is absolutely right. And I think the teaching hospitals, the group that you represent and work with, need to work harder on that. Because if you, Massachusetts is an outlier. I think we have three community hospitals left. I mean, you know, we're dominated by academic health centers. And that's all well and good for certain things, but it's not always good for community care. So, but the good news is, I mean, I take your former employer. I think Partners and Massachusetts General is doing a lot much more than I would have thought, or they would have even thought, about really going out into the community. So, I mean, I've been, <coughs> occasionally they yell at me, but I've been supportive of what Tim Ferriss and others are doing there. And more and more uh, teaching hospitals need to do that. So, Karen, you're absolutely right. But 
if you're going to be part of that, you have to be part of the solution, which is to get our overall spending down. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Charlotte Hi. Yang, the Chief Medical Officer for AARP Services, Inc. So first of all, Stu, you know, someone who's lived and grown up in Massachusetts, thank you for your service to Massachusetts for the country. I mean, we've learned so much from you. Um, so I wanted to ask about another private um, Medicare payment discrepancy, which is teaching. You know, the medical education that is really borne by Medicare um, and not paid for in the private sector. So how do you see that difference playing out as we try and level set between the private sector and Medicare? Well, first of all, I don't think teaching is being paid for only by Medicare. I think a, to, I think a part of that gap is a legitimate part of the gap. One of the things that I really like about Maryland is Maryland, since I was an advisor there for several years, Maryland makes explicit what it's going to pay a hospital based in part on what it teaches and also what it does in research. When, when people make a distinction, they say, well, the, here's a big teaching hospital charging 100% more than a community hospital. That 100%, part of it is, I think, a very legitimate difference because I do believe, in spite of, there's no word that says it, but part of that gap is paying for teaching, is paying for the extra amount of money for research, and I think legitimately. And the thing about Maryland, it explicitly gives Hopkins credit for doing that, and University of Maryland, relative to the community hospitals. I think we need, even if we don't do rate setting, we need to dig into that gap and make explicit what is a legitimate, in terms of community, a, a legitimate higher rate, and what may be a questionable one. So, um, and I believe, you know, we do need to pay for teaching. Uh, ideally, you would like to pay for teaching out of a separate budget. But, in, you know, when I was on the bipartisan commission, we had some uh, other senators who were arguing that. I said, well, first show me that you passed the law that paid for that, then you can take it out. Don't take it out first and then say, well, maybe we'll pass a law. So I'm where you are, Charlotte. We need to pay for teaching. But private insurance is paying for a lot of the teaching. I want to get up for anybody else. But um, I, on, the, on the issue of paying for teaching, I, um, I have a, an anecdote that I think people would find amusing. When I was at CMS, um, the people from what was then the general accounting office came to CMS and said, what are some sexy issues we can, uh, we can investigate? And I said, well, you know, one thing that's always troubled me is we really don't know how much it costs to train a physician. <laughs> yeah. I so, remember an Institute of Medicine study back in the early 70s on what's the cost of teaching. You can uh, go back and look at so it. I, so I said to them, your middle name is accounting. So go account for the cost of teaching and, and come up with some estimate of how much it actually costs to train a physician. And then a few months later, they changed their name to the Government Accountability Office and I took, I take personal, I take personal credit for that, that they got accounting out of their name. <laughs> David? Stuart, thank you for that talk. Uh, I've learned so many things from you over the years. I want to thank you for that and uh, also for your service in many, many respects. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that um, I learned from you, and it wasn't mentioned in your introduction, so I want to highlight it, was that it's no fun to set prices. No, that's... Uh, so, Stuart, it's not why... It, many in this room know, but if you don't, uh, I'll remind you that Stuart uh, was responsible for price controls for the nation in the healthcare sector during 1973-74, wasn't it? During the, was that the right time frame? And I was fantastic. You were great. <laughs> so, and, and it was one of the few times in the history of our country when the rate of increase in healthcare costs fell below or comparable to GDP. So it was a very successful cost control strategy. So, um, which brings me back to the, my surprise that you didn't once during your com this conversation, during this talk, talk about 
explicitly about rate setting uh, and an observation which is that one of the reasons why hospitals charge so much more to private payers than they do to Medicare is because they can. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, and why wouldn't they if they can? That's what and I said. so the question is, how, what could possibly change that dynamic? Because if you could empower private payers to get better rates, they would get better rates, and that differential would go down. So as a rate setter, what's your reaction to this issue, which is now reemerging? It's, yeah, it as is. you pointed out correctly, it's, it's not even subliminal anymore in Medicare for All. It's right out front. Uh, how are we, is there any solution to controlling private rates other than the, the role that you played so successfully and so painfully 40-some uh, years ago? So, uh, not kidding. Uh, as I said, I was a phenomenal rate setter at... <laughs> There are three characteristics you need to be to be a good rate setter in healthcare. You should be very young and healthy. <laughs> you should know very little about the industry. And you need to be very arrogant. And I hit all three. <laughs> I was 32 years old. To tell you that I knew next to nothing about healthcare was an overstatement. <laughs> and Economists next to surgeons are the most arrogant people you can meet. I figured I can do this. The president wants me to control costs, I can control costs. And you're absolutely right. I'm not 32 anymore. I have a, uh, but I have a role now. And the reason why I mentioned Massachusetts, I do think we're kind of like sneaking up on regulation without regulating. Because we don't have authority to set prices, but what we do have the authority to do is if any payer, provider, or any other part of the system exceeds that benchmark, we can call them in, secretly talk to them. If they don't change their way, we can find them. We, we can even turn them over to the Attorney General. So we don't regulate the rates, but we have led with this system in, Ma in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island and more directly in, in Maryland to begin to constrain the growth in the private rates. And the advantages of not being an explicit regulator but being an, a sort of an implicit one, and surprise of surprises, it's actually working. And, and the other thing is that it's not being done in a draconian way. I, I'm sorry. You may have a lot of Medicare for all people here, but what scares me is the potential of taking four or five hundred billion dollars out of the healthcare system within a year or two. I'm falling apart. If I was 32 years old, I wouldn't care. I do care, and I, I think the way we're doing it in Massachusetts in a more gradual way relative to the rate of growth in our state or to the country is a much more it's a much more sensible way of doing it. So yeah, I, I think we, at the end of the day, we need to do something to constrain those pride. And you can do it either by the market, and that means with, with, um, with these networks and people don't like them, where you can regulate them, uh, or you can let this thing grow. So you, you got it right. And I'm not gonna do it again. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Stuart, Art Kellerman, I'm uh, the dean of what I like to call America's Medical School up in Bethesda at the Uniformed Services University. And yes. as a health educator, I'm training folks. I, I winced a bit at an early remark you made when you said, you know, getting doctors or getting like, to do better care to save money, it, that's just not going to work. We need to figure out, and you kind of move quickly to payment. I'm still struggling with the fact that a lot of the data, including out of the National Academy of Medicine, suggests 25, 30 percent of what we do in American medicine is inappropriate or unnecessary or overdiagnosis or overtreatment. That's a whole lot of money. And recently, Health Affairs, their new issue came out with projections of 5.5 percent growth year over year in the healthcare system. 
I'm not good with a calculator when zeros get that high, but it looks like that would imply that we're going to spend $192 billion more next year than last year on medical care and $200 billion more the year after that. Surely we can do better than with what we do with actually managing patients and populations than we are today and not just assume it's hopeless because otherwise I really worry we're not going to survive as a, as a country spending so much of our economy on health care as opposed to education, um, national security, debt relief, et cetera. Think about the bloody battles we're having over a few billion dollars for a wall and we're going to quietly spend another $192 billion on health care next year. So I'm, you're right. the wise man in this room. This is the Stuart Altman fan club. I came just to be in a room with this many rock stars. So help me with that right. really well, challenging question. All right. I don't know how much time you have, so I'll just try to, I'll just try to keep it. And I may be a minority of one here, but I've learned some lessons in my life. And one of the most con reducing costs does not reduce necessarily spending. So first of all, what I said I believe in. Look, I'm not a physician, but I am a patient. And I, and I think of all the times that I've gone to a doctor or gotten a test result that was uh, benign, or, you know, and uh, fine. And somebody could say that was a waste. I felt better. Second, when we compare ourselves to other countries which are spending 11, 12% of their GDP, we do not use more of the most expensive care than they do. They're wasting as much as we are. I'm not saying there's not unnecessary care out there. There's a lot of it. And, but, but having an outside force like me, because I did it, come in and say, you can't do this, you can do that, I, doesn't work. And the fact that it was 40% in 1971 and 40% today ought to tell you something. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Of course it exists. Part of it is because we want to, part of it is the nature of health care. And I admire physicians that have to take people's lives in their hands. So, but that's the other part of the coin is, and here you and I can disagree, just because you've you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. I'm, and how much did that cost? I add all three of you together, and that added up to $100 million. Say, well, that's gone. It isn't gone. One of the things that I've learned is that if you don't do that, they'll figure out someone else to spend the money, if the money's there to spend. I had a very interesting lesson when, in my new job. There was a group of physicians that were gonna be merging with somebody else, another big group and they were gonna get a 30% increase. Well, they were merging. And the answer was, why are you merging? They said, well, look at all the savings we're gonna get. We're gonna be able to, to do uh, information technology in one group. We're gonna be able to do this and we'll do that. And so I sort of naively said, and as a result of that, you're gonna lower prices? They said, oh, no, no, we need the money to do this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can guarantee you with as much gut that if you reduced costs by 10%, you will not reduce spending by anywhere near 10%. If you give people that believe they're doing the right thing the money, they'll figure out something else to do. So I'm not saying there's not waste or excess, but I'm saying it's very hard to find, and, and the best way to do it is to reduce the revenue and say to the delivery system, you figure out the best way to do it because you don't want 32-year-old Altmans telling them what to do because they're there to do it. And as I said, I'm no longer 32. So I don't disagree with you. Uh, yes, there is that there, but that's not the way to control spending. I'm sorry. So. Maybe this could be our last question. Yeah, so I'll encourage you to expand the scope slightly. This is fascinating. The, I hadn't realized the enormous dif disparity. Oh, I'm Joanne Lynn from Alterum's program to improve elder care. Because um, I work almost entirely in Medicare, so I forgot that there was this enormous gap. Do you think that the current interest 
in getting Medicare involved in providing social supports might in some way um, be a piece of the answer. Um, I, I'm really worried about it because it seems like we'll only pay for food if you otherwise would be expensive in the medical care system. But where it seems like we should pay for food because people are hungry. Um, but it expands the scope of what medical care might have at least some responsibility for and therefore kind of returns a, a focus to the community because you can't really provide food except directly through a community endeavor. Um, is there some way in which that could be helpful rather than harmful? I mean, right now it's only in Medicare, but presumably that could spread. It always has. Uh, the other thing is, could we, in a sense, directly tackle some of the incomes? It seems to me, I mean, when I, when I remember when I first graduated from residency or left residency, I took an AMA course in how to run a practice. And one of the things that I distinctly remember was being told that it's reasonable to aim for about twice the income of school teachers in your area. <laughs> That's been left behind so long ago. Uh, you know, and, and when I was first in practice, the hospital administrators made less money than the, than the primary care doctors. And now they make millions and millions. So, you know, there's something about the pay scale that, um, you know, is really quite distorted. You want to tackle either of those? <laughs> well, I don't... <laughs> I, I, I've sort of stayed away from you know, where the money is. And there's no question that there, a lot of the money sits in the form of compensation for those of us in healthcare. You know, there was more than a few articles written lately that, you know, and most of us are the benefactors of it. So I'm not here criticizing others. I tell people, you know, I've been a consultant in healthcare and my job is to take a little tin cup and take the drippings off the table. I drive a Lexus. I, I got a new I got a new sport jacket, so I'm not, and 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 I'm a pauper because, as you said, hospital administrators make millions of dollars now where it used to be, and and they're not alone. And you know, I used to be a bit of a critic of what physicians are being paid. I don't. Physicians are down the list, lawyers, consultants, and everybody. I mean, if you want to see a real difference between America and other countries. They're a disgrace. You go there, they don't drive new cars, as, you know, the administrator. I went to a group of admini hospital administrators in France. I, I was embarrassed. They didn't have new suits. <laughs> so there's a lot of differences, and there's a lot of quote-unquote ways. So life is very different now. And as I said, one of the main reasons why is that we've essentially given I wouldn't say a blank check to the American healthcare system, but it's pretty close. Thank you very much. So would you all join us for reception and honor stood right outside this room. So thank you for joining us.